just kind of a line I've heard over and over and over again. If you really want to see what somebody's priorities are, take a look at their bank account and take a look at their calendar. Those two things, what they do with their time and money, are going to expose what's important to them. So really all I want to do in this exercise is just talk about those two things. Just what are you doing with your time when things go right? And what are you doing with your money? And so let's just dive into this. Let's dive into the money piece right off the bat. So what to do when things go right? First thing is we need money for our opportunity for the fuel to run your business. I just call it walking around money. We all need walking around money. Now, how much walking around money do we need in our businesses? Like, what should your business bank account be? I think everybody's going to have a different number. But I think we all want to be prepared for the opportunities that come our way. I don't want to be the guy going to Sidcor as if you're the bank and I want you to fund this venture that I need to do. Like, I don't have enough on my own. I need your help. No, I want to do stuff on my own that I don't have to go to Vera for or Gary for. It's my money. So an example that came up, I had an opportunity years ago to expand into San Francisco. Now, if you guys just open up a map of opportunities, we, ha we have no presence in the Bay. I mean, so there's 10 million plus people up in the Bay. Something tells me there's a few campaigns we could do up there, right? So it's a nice territory up there, but it's expensive. This is what keeps people out of it. Uh, I'm going to promote a rookie owner up there. And, you know, the landlord wants to see, you know, financial, some of them. Obviously, this is a rookie owner. There's no financials to submit, but the hub manager put some, you know, whatever she could. It's like, okay, hey, I'm not signing a lease with this guy. So the landlord wanted me to sign the lease to do a co-sign. I did not want to do, I'm not going to open up offices all across the country with my name on leases across the country. So I said to the landlord, I'm like, well, there's got to be something we can do. How about I give you six months rent up front as an additional deposit? So we'll do the normal first and last month's rent. I'll do six months up front, and after a year track record, you give me that cash back. The landlord's like, you know what? That's a fair and reasonable offer. Let's do it. So we did it. I have to come out of pocket $40,000 for that. So again, I need a certain amount of money for walking around money. My business bank account needs to have X, and everything after X can then go to Jamie Hep Personal. Okay, so that's the first thought. I don't, I'm not telling you guys something you probably don't already know, but come up with that number. I've heard some people have a formula of like, well, for every outside deal you have, you should have 10,000 saved. I'm like, where'd you get that from? You know, I don't know. But just you come up with your own number. I don't think there's a right or a wrong, but you need a comfort number for your business, for walking around money, for any little thing that's going to happen in your business without you having to go to Uncle Sidcourt to bail you out. You got to bail yourself out. Okay, my second piece with money, again, what to do when things go right? Eliminate monthly recurring expenses. I'm obsessed with this to the point my cell phone carrier has been Verizon for 20 plus years. I did the math on, hey, how much am I spending month over month for 20 years? It's a, it's a gross number, right? There's a reason why these companies pay such big money for these contracts. We bring them because customers will stick around like I have for 20 plus years. I called Verizon to ask, hey, how much can I pay you where I don't have a monthly bill anymore? There's got to be a number. Oh, that's a weird request. Hold, please. Go to the next prompting. That's a weird request. Hold, please. I go nine layers into Verizon. They said, we don't have that program. It doesn't exist. But you know American Airlines has that? You, there's a fee you can pay where you basically fly standby you know, for a certain dollar amount. It, I heard it was like close to a million dollars for this. But anything you can do to eliminate monthly recurring expenses is a smart thing for you to do. I remember the first hundred grand I had saved, right? I, I got so excited. I'm like, I finally have six figures saved. Like I've made it, right? Like, we, all, <laughs> we all know you haven't made it with a hundred K in the bank. But I remember calling Larry Tenenbaum and I'm like, hey, I got a hundred thousand saved. What should I do? And he gave me the very unmotivating advice. He asked me, he says, Jamie, do you have a mortgage? I'm like, yes, I have a mortgage. He, mortgage. he says, pay it off. I'm like, pay it off. No, but Larry, I've got a hundred grand. So what I was looking for is how do you turn a hundred to 200 within a year? Is, does that exist? Like, how do you double your money? And again, it was unmotivating advice because it was so conservative, like just pay off your mortgage. And he said something to me that has stuck with me for years. And I've ran this way. He says, Jamie, 
my business is my Las Vegas. That's my risk in business. There's, you know, again, that San Francisco deal that I set up could have imploded on me and I could have been out $40,000. That's where all this risk takes place. He says, once that money goes from business to personal, I want to remove risk from the equation. I don't need risk in my personal life. I'll take plenty of risk in my business life. So the more you can reduce your monthly recurring expenses, like if you can live debt free, if you can, again, it's obviously let's pay off credit card debt, let's pay off student loan debt. Well, let's pay off mortgage debt as well too. When you have your house paid off cash, your vehicles paid off cash, and you're like, gee, what are your monthly expenses? And you can you bring your cost of living down? Just if you've played the game cash flow or you subscribe to Robert Kiyosaki, he's got a very simple equation for this that we should all be very, uh, pay close attention to. When passive income exceeds cost of living, you win. Your passive income, right? What is passive income? It's income that comes in that requires no work on your part. It's dividends, it's interest, right? It's rent, you know, you've got your landlord, you've got renters paying you. When, you're, when your passive income exceeds your cost of living, if you play the game cash flow, that's how you win. You're going around the, the board, kind of like Monopoly. You now have your, your cost of living smaller than your passive income. You win, you're now playing in the dream board and the game is basically over. Play that game. The more you play that game, the more you're gonna be thinking, Gee, I got to reduce my cost of living. Get rid of monthly recurring expenses. Okay, live debt free. Don't live high on the hog would be my advice. And then the last piece I have with money is invest in money making money. I think there's a good reason why they say that the first million is the hardest million to make. Well, because the second million and thereafter, you've got compound interest working in your favor. The like compounding's working in your favor. I mean, here's a great Warren Buffett quote. My, my wealth has come from a combination of living in America, lucky genes, and compound interest. Interest on interest. For my, my son's birthday, I set up a, just a high yield savings account for him with a, a Brio, part of Webster's Bank on the East Coast. So usually when there's no brick and mortar stores in your state, you can get a high interest rate just on a just a savings account. So they pay him 5.2%. But every month, right, when that, you know, so he started off with $5,000 in there. So get five grand in there. Every month they give you a statement and we're just tracking how much interest he's making on the interest. And I just want that cemented in his head. Like you're getting paid to be a saver, interest on interest. So again, look for money making opportunities. Again, what, what do you do when things go well? I mean, uh, there's real estate to be had, there's stocks to be had, there's life insurance to be had as a money-making tool for you. Um, obviously, I don't want to go down a Bitcoin path or anything like that, but Brennan gave me a big pitch, I think a couple years ago at a NatCon, like, Jamie, you're missing out. And I'm kind of like, oh, it's trading so high. It's like, it's like 17,000. He's like, Jamie, trust me, the thing's going to go to a million. I'm like, a million? And then he gave me this whole long spiel on, you know, banks and America and all this other stuff. So I sucked it up and I got in at around 17 grand and now I feel fairly smart, you know, as it's trading at 70,000 plus. But there's a lot of people seem to think it's going to be hundreds of thousands. Kiyosaki seems to think it'll be a hundred grand by the end of June. And guys like Brennan seem to think it's going to be a million. So I, my answer is, listen, I'm not all about Bitcoin. I'm not all about real estate. I'm not all about stocks. I'm all about a little piece of everything. Because if one tanks, hopefully the other does well. If Bitcoin does tank, because Warren Buffett would say, if the whole thing, if, if I could buy all the Bitcoins for 25 bucks, I wouldn't know what to do with it. Because then I have to sell it to somebody else. So, he, so again, I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is if that does crash, well, there's real estate to be, to be had. So do it all. But look for money-making opportunities. And just remember that Kiyosaki equation of passive income has to exceed cost of living. And I think the more you guys obsess about that, as you guys get into your later years in life, you know, Becky and I were having a conversation. I'm like, hey, I'm in my 50s now. So far, the 50s have been better than the 40s. The 40s were better than the 30s. The 30s were better than the 20s. 20s were better than teens. I can give you the testimony of life is getting better. And guys like Gary Polson make me look forward. He says, Jamie, I'm living the best years of my life now. I'm like, really? Now you're living your best life? He says, I've got grandchildren. 
I'm like, oh, gee, I'm looking forward to be a grandfather. You know, Gary's like one of those only guys that makes me look forward to aging. But I'm telling you guys, if you do this right, you can look forward to aging. Look for those money-making opportunities. Be smart with your money. All right? So I want to shift gears now into time. Okay, so what do you do with your time? What do you do when things go right? Well, I want to say this. If you find purpose in your work, you'll work hard. Okay, you'll work hard even without noticing that you're working hard when you find purpose in your work. And if you're not energized by your work, you should do a deep dive and look into this. I don't think the goal is to work really hard at something and then just check out and go for a ride. So I think we have to frame our minds properly, and especially the new generation coming through the ranks, because I was under the impression growing up through the business that the goal was to become like a, a consultant, get to a consultant level, and then just you're living on 101 Easy Street the rest of your life and you don't have to work hard anymore. And I'm like, looking back at that, I'm like, that's kind of foolish. That's a really foolish train of thought. Plus it's like, I mean, there's statistics of when people retire, six months later they die. Like Gary Polson was telling me his dad had a conversation with the doctor and his doctor's like, hey, listen, whatever you do, just don't fully retire. Because when men lose their purpose in life, they basically have no reason to wake up in the morning and they die. So have a reason to wake up in the morning. So to me, I just want to make sure that, hey, I've got purpose in my work. I've got to have fulfilling um, elements to my work. And if I'm losing energy with my work, I got to do a deep dive, like what's wrong here? How can I reinvent myself? What should I do a little bit different with my work? But the name of the game, I want to work hard. I mean, your people are working hard for you. So I think it's only right that we work hard for our people. So we should never really stop wanting to work hard for our people, considering how hard they have to work for your comfortable lifestyle. So just have that paradigm of like, hey, I'm going to be a hard worker. Like, Look at guys like Elon Musk. Look at any of these heavyweights that are so successful in business, they're not checking out. I mean, Elon still sleeps at the factory. And then he gets into Twitter and he's sleeping in the boardroom at Twitter. I mean, he, the guy has mad passion with his work and that's why he works so hard. So again, if you lost a little bit of that fire, you may want to do a deep dive. Like, why, do I, why am I, have I lost my energy? And I'll get into some of this stuff here in a second on you know, some things we can do about that. But I think we should have the expectation that we're going to work hard. I want my kids to see me working hard. I want my, you know, I have, I have a fear that my girls, especially, because my son was, he saw me through the grind. You know, he's 14 now, so he saw me really grinding. I've got a fear that my girls might have the wrong expectations of their future husbands, that, well, my dad was at home all the time and we had plenty of money, so how come you can't be at home and just set them up for a failing marriage? Like, Hey, listen, little girls, no, when daddy was in his 20s and 30s, no, but dad, I just remember what I saw. And if they see lazy dad that happens to have a bunch of money, they're going to think that that's what marriage looks like. And there couldn't be a more failing recipe for my girls than that. So they have to see dad working hard. And your kids got to see you working hard. Okay, another piece with time. Efficiency, Okay. Sometimes when we try to get more efficient, this can screw us up. Now, I heard this. I'm going to share this with you because this really got my hamsters running years ago, and I think it'll get yours running. Jamie, what can you delegate? What can you automate? And what can you eliminate? Be more efficient with your time. I'm all about that. Oh, gee, you really got me thinking. What can I automate? What can I do that's just automatic that I don't have to be involved in that process anymore? What should I stop doing? What should I eliminate? And what should I delegate? I think these are great questions we should ask ourselves and we should all want to be more efficient with our time. So then I just want to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole with delegation, okay? So I was asking Vera, you know, like, you know, she's involved in so many aspects of the business. Like, Vera, what are you delegating? What are you not delegating? And something interesting, we could all agree that Rich is pretty competent at what he does, right? He's very good at what he does. Rich can go schmooze any client and have a great rapport, great relationship, but Vera still goes with Rich to those meetings. She goes 
to visit AT&T. She goes to Verizon. She hasn't completely 100% delegated that task to Rich. And rightfully so, I agree with her mindset. You shouldn't outsource that. You shouldn't delegate that. Like you should kind of own a piece of that as the CEO of the business because it's, it's just that important. I mean, if our clients decide to cut our commissions or lose a program, I mean, we'd all be crippled. We'd have our left hand tied behind our back in this fight. So she's not delegating that. She's participating with her partner in that battle. So what are the things that we should not delegate that maybe we do a little too much? And I want to just go through five that I have kind of been scratching the surface on. One of them is the relationship building. Okay, so are we delegating the relationship building? I mean, I've heard it so many times as people age in the business, and I've experienced this too. It, it doesn't take long, doesn't take many years until you become the old guy at team night. And everybody wanted to stay up, and you know, I think Holly made a reference today on stage, like, dude, I don't want to be playing beer pong seven nights a week. That's just not how I roll. Like, I'd rather have a dinner over my house or something. So should we be delegating the relationship building piece in our business? My answer is no, just maybe do it smarter. I'm usually the first guy out at team night. Like nothing good happens after midnight. It's kind of my opinion. And even midnight, like I remember I was at a R and R conference and we were in Miami and it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm about to check into bed. Hey, yeah, come, we're going to a bar. Hey, we'll come with us. I'm like, what's going to happen between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. that I'm missing out on? Come on, go ahead. Give me a pitch for some FOMO. Like, Jamie, here's what you're missing out on. You're going to be screaming in somebody's ear all night. You're going to feel horrible when you wake up at noon the next day. I'm like, I ain't missing out on anything. I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll be the guy at the pool looking bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I'll be watching for you guys strolling into the pool at 2 p.m. <laughs> you know, because they have to sleep. So I'm like, you know what? I can go to team night, and you know what? I can end team night off with you know, maybe buying around or buying some appetizers and be the guy to check out early. So I can just be more efficient with that, but I don't want to outsource the relationship building piece. Um, you should also look for high ROIs in your business. Part of the whole like, well, I don't feel energized by my work kind of thing. Well, it might be because some of your people might be sucking the awesome out of you. So maybe gravitate to the, har the, the high return on investment people. I was listening to a podcast uh, the other day with a mentee of John Maxwell, and I can't remember his name. Uh, I should. Um, but he's talking about what it's like being coached by John Maxwell. And I'm like, oh, gee, what a privilege would that be, right? Um, I actually, I met Maxwell um, a couple times. I asked him if he would coach me, and he laughed at me and just said, no. He coaches 10 people, and I wasn't going to be one of the lucky 10. But uh, this guy was one of the lucky 10 guys coached by John Maxwell. And he says that how his strategy was before he would meet up with John again, because John would shoot him texts and John would want to meet up like, oh, I really like you. Hey, let's meet up. Let's go for lunch. He would not do it until he proves to John that that hour of your time you invested in me has compounded. I need to prove something to John and then meet up for that next meeting with Mr. Maxwell. And then John will be motivated to keep giving me more and more time. I mean, what a dream it would be for us if all the people that we coach operated like that. So maybe we need to regurgitate that story, or maybe we need to become that guy who's a, a high ROI for the people that are coaching you, and your people in turn do that with you, and you gravitate your time and energy into those people. That's a smart use of your time. And avoid the ask holes. I don't know if you guys have coined this term yet, the ask hole. Somebody that asks you for advice and doesn't take it. There's nothing more frustrating as a coach than hanging out with a bunch of ask holes. So avoid them and gravitate to the, har, the high uh, ROIs. You like that one, Bill? Ask hole. Never heard that? You heard it now. All right, so then just a couple questions. Recruiting. I said, hey, there's five things that, like, do you really want to delegate? No, there, I think you just have to ask yourself, what piece of this do I need to own? And what piece of this do I need to delegate? If somebody's better at writing ads than me, do I need to write my own ads? You don't have to. So you sure you can delegate that. Well, Jamie, I don't want to be the one ripping through resume, pulling resumes. You can outsource that. I guess the question I have for you is, is recruiting important for your business? And I think all of you would be like, well, it's wildly important. My question back to you is, 
Well, what piece should you own? If it's that important, if it's important enough that our clients uh, are so important for our business that Vera takes time out of her schedule to travel to visit the clients with the competent rich, surely we must be involved at some level in the recruiting piece of our business. The third piece I have is the productivity and standards. Well, yeah, my campaign manager you know, runs the dollar per rep. He's the one running the, the campaign meeting or she's the one running the campaign meeting. Okay, great, but what piece do you own? I mean, that's a, a vital area of our business, right? So we've got the relationship building, we've got the recruiting, we've got the productivity and standards. Then I like, I like this choice of words. How about the soul of your business? The integrity, the character, the results with integrity that we've built our company on. Do you really want to outsource the values or delegate the values of the business to somebody else? Delegate that to the leaders? Delegate that to the leaders who are then involved in the recruiting process and nowhere in the recruiting process is the soul of the business exposed. So what piece do you want to own? And what piece do you want to delegate? I'm not saying you've got to own all of this, but we certainly want to own a, a part of this, but the soul of the business. And then the last piece I have for you with the, you know, what do you want to de delegate? I mean, how about the finances? What is your relationship with the hub? What is the relationship between CEOs and CFOs? It was funny listening to Vera describe her conversation with Lalo with having the cash you know, on hand at the business. And, and uh, Lalo's like, no, you can't. And she's like, hang on a second. Can you tell me what to do? I mean, what is your relationship like with your hub? I mean, shouldn't the hub be the one who's reporting the money, okay, listen, Jamie, here's all the money that you as the owner have decided to spend. And I'm just reporting the data back to you so then you can make good decisions for your business. I think that's really the role of the hub. The hub is not the boss of the finances. You're the boss. But you don't want to be just outsourcing that. Like, hey, hub, do I have enough money too? You got to know how much money you have and you can game plan and go, uh, uh, you can set some goals with your hub but uh, they are reporting the data to you. You're the one making the financial decisions for your business. All right, and so then, again, with time, I've got somewhat of an embarrassing story to tell you here. And Matt, I think you were a part of this. There, years ago, does the name Renee Cooper ring a bell to you? Years ago, so uh, Renee Cooper. I hired, a, I hired a, uh, this woman who's a consultant who I spent a lot of money on this individual for, I wanted some extra executive training, like outside of the stuff that I'm used to seeing in our business. And she charged me a thousand bucks an hour. Like she was a professional, Harvard graduate, like this girl knew her stuff. And the first thing she wanted to do is, hey, Jamie, we need a 360 degree assessment of where you're at. So I need, for whatever reason, we came up with 13 names. And I think you were one of them. I think Dorfman was one of them. Vera, the list went on. And she, wanted to interview you guys about, hey, what do you think about Jamie? What do you like about Jamie? What do you dislike? What should he start doing? What should he stop doing? Yada, yada, yada. And so I get this, I remember uh, we met at an airport uh, for the first time so she could give me the report face to face. She wouldn't email it to me. And she just wanted to watch the look on my face as I read this report. And the part of the report that really stung, there were several pieces that stung, but the part of the report, so it's obvious Jamie's business is important to him. It's obvious that Jamie's children are important to him. But we think his wife, Joanne, just isn't a very big priority in his life. And it might be something he takes a good look at. And I'm like, what? Because I've been working my butt off for years for my wife. I mean, she's my, my why. And so I'm reading this. And, and, and so that was one of the pieces that we're, I'm just like, this is what they said about me? Like, and I picked the people that I wanted to interview. It's not like she picked them. I picked the people. So then I'm like, I am kind of got my tail between my legs. I go home. Joanne's like, oh, how was, how was your meeting with Renee? I'm like, it wasn't good. And I'm like, I want you to read this. So now I put the report in her hands, and I'm watching her face. Um, and so <laughs> I'm getting emotional just thinking about this. She, she puts the report, report down. She says, everything in this report is true. And I'm like, Really? Like, you're not, like, you don't know how important you are to me. Like, I work, I do what I do for you. Yeah, you have a, you have a hard way of showing it. I mean, so 
So then after I'm, I'm, I'm getting some awareness of what's going on, I got to go see good old coach Gary. And I'm telling him like, Gary, I think I'm failing in my marriage. Like I'm, I'm doing well in business. I'm doing, I think I'm a good dad. I'm coaching my kids sports. And apparently my peers seem to think I'm a good dad too. They just don't think I'm a, such a good husband. And Joanne doesn't think I'm such a good husband. And he's listening to me and he's nodding. And, and I'm, so I'm like, what do I do? And he's just, all he, all he said to me is, Jamie, I want it all. Like, I don't want to have to compromise like, well, I'm a great dad, I'm a great at business, but I'm out of shape and don't have time for the gym, or I don't have time for my wife. I want it all. And Jamie, you can have it all. The pro Jamie, all your answers are going to be in your planner. Where is Joanne in your planner? Where is your preparation for your time with Joanne in your planner? All your answers are going to be in your planner and thinking about what you want to do in advance. And I'm just saying this, this is kind of my, how I'm going to put a bow on this piece here with time. You can have it all. I am convinced you can have it all. Being the guy who turned the ship with my marriage, and I would say my marriage with my wife is better than it's ever been today. Thank goodness for Renee Cooper and people like Matt being honest. <laughs> I keep, just because you're sitting here, I'm thinking of you. You might have said good things about me. I don't know. But, um, you know, but, but you can have it all. Like you really can have it all. You can have your cake and eat it too. I know there are plenty of people, I kind of grew up like the people that were successful in business didn't have great family lives. And the people that had great family lives weren't doing so great financially. You can have it all. And we have role models in our business that do have it all. And I'm saying you can have it all. The answer comes down to your relationship with your planner. So I hope you and your planning system have an intimate time together where you guys can really think through the week, what do you want to do, and how do you make the most of your time with your spouse, with your kids, and your business. And just the last piece I want to say has, with time is always look for time to improve. I think Ricky did a good job this morning on stage really talking about that. I mean, you got to learn, you got to grow, you got to reinvent yourself. You have not arrived. You're a work in progress, as am I. The journey will never end. You'll die still on the journey at some point, but you got to look to reinvent yourself. You got to look to be, you know, 2.0. So even just, I'll share something personal with you guys. I mean, I decided to write a book. I'm publishing a book at the end of the year. So I'm like, okay, well, let me reinvent myself here a little bit. So uh, it's funny. I was, I've been writing the book for 14 years. I was telling Matt about this. I'm like, ever since Dane was born, my first child, I started documenting, just uh, writing to him, writing letters to my son. Just because I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to die, but if I happen to die young I, and my kids don't know who dad was, I just wanted to, I don't know, give them something. This is from your dad to you. So I really wrote this book to my kids and then got the courage to say, okay, let me open this up and let's see, you know, maybe I'll sell more than three books. But, but I got to sell three, you know, one to Dane, Annie, and Vienna. If I sell four, great. If I only sell three, great. And if the three people all give me a one-star review that I care about, then I failed big time, right? So I just want three five-star reviews from my kids. But I'm just telling you, you know, it takes guts to try to reinvent yourself. It takes guts to kind of throw yourself out there. Even doing these YouTube videos and stuff, I dedicated to doing them for one year and then I was going to stop doing it. I just wanted to kind of put something out there, put a bunch of morning meetings, you know, online so my owners could access them. And, you know, I don't know what to run today. Let me get Jamie to run my morning meeting for me today. That was really the intent of it all. And then just enough people said, hey, keep doing it. So I just kept doing it. But the name of the game is reinvent yourself. Look to grow. You're not done. So try to become 2.0.